there's a ton of false information out there about karma. And get this, if you don't understand what karma is and how to work with it, you can stay stuck struggling with the same issues and experiences over and over again. No! So what is karma really? And how does it affect your life? I'll be answering these questions in this video, and most importantly, I will help you learn how to work with karma so you can use it to your advantage and spiritually grow faster than you ever thought possible. Coming up! Hello, beautiful soul. This is Christina Lopes, the Heart Alchemist, here to help you open your heart, heal your past, and live with purpose. If you're new to my videos, click on that subscribe button and also on the bell so you get notified as soon as I publish new content. And don't forget to follow me over on Instagram where I share tips that you won't find here on YouTube. Okay, on to part one of the video, and that is, what is karma? <laughs> so I'm gonna start talking about karma um, from the two traditions where, where this concept, where this understanding originated from, but then I'm gonna depart significantly. So I'm gonna talk about how karma is seen in Hinduism and in Buddhism, and then I'm gonna depart a bit because um, I'm gonna give you a little bit more of my understanding of karma and how, how I have come to see it over the years. So first into the two traditions, that talk about karma the most, and that's Hinduism and then Buddhism afterwards. Uh, Buddhism came after Hinduism. And so ideally what uh, karma means for Hindus and for Buddhists also, there's only a little bit of a difference in the particularity of how they see karma. For Hinduism, karma really just means that for every action, there's a reaction, okay? So you reap what you sow. I bet you've heard that before too, okay? So, so karma refers to any kind of reaction that you get from life coming, stemming from your actions, all right? Now, the only difference that Buddhism, I'm not gonna get into too many details on the differences between how these two traditions see karma, but there's one particular area that I think is worth mentioning, and that is that Buddhists see karma not just through actions, but also through intention. Ding, ding! <laughs> this is really important because I, I completely agree with the Buddhist tradition on the view of karma. They give a lot of importance to intention whereas in Hinduism, the importance is given more on the action itself, okay? And so I'll give you an example of how this works. So let's say you are driving down the road and let's say that you maliciously want to crash into someone. Let's say it's your ex, whatever. Your ex is driving in front of you and you're really pissed off at them and you maliciously crash your car into your ex on purpose to hurt them and you kill them on the road, okay? So that's one action. And then let's say that you are driving down the road. Let's say it's a totally different situation. You're driving down the road. It's been a really long day. You're so tired, so tired. And for a fraction of a second, as you're driving down the freeway, you just nod off. You just fall asleep for a fraction of a second. And when you wake up, you come to and you crash into someone and you cause a bunch of deaths on the road, okay? These two actions are completely different in terms of their karmic consequences for Buddhists, okay? Why? Because in one action, I had the intention of hurting someone, whereas in the other action, I did not, okay? So the karmic consequences of that are completely different, even though the actions themselves can seem like they're similar, okay? So that's the difference between how Hinduism sees karma and how uh, Buddhism sees karma, and I think that this is a really important distinction to make, okay? So karma just simply means for every action, for every intention, a reaction comes from life, okay? So that's the way that karma is seen in the two main traditions that discuss it the most. Okay, now let's depart significantly from the main traditions that usually talk about karma, and let's go into a different way of seeing the same thing, really. It's just a different way of explaining it, okay? So think of karma as a mirror, all right? There are two, two ways I like to look at karma. Karma is like a mirror, all right? So what karma does is it's constantly showing you the reflection that, that you're giving it, <laughs> okay? So a mirror shows you an accurate reflection of whatever's standing in front of it, right? So that's one way of seeing karma. Karma is simply a reflecting back of whatever you're giving it or whatever you're putting in front of it, all right? Another way of seeing karma that I really love is that karma is a feedback system. Okay, now what does this mean? <laughs> Karma is a feedback system in the sense that 
without a mirroring, without a feedback system, I wouldn't be able to know myself. I wouldn't be able to self realize. <laughs> and sometimes people don't know what that really means. What do you mean? Why do I need mirrors? Why do I need a feedback system? And let me give you this example to, to, to clear this up for you. Suppose that you had never in your life, just try and imagine this. I know it's hard to imagine, but try and imagine this exercise. Pretend that you had never ever in your whole life seen your own reflection. <laughs> imagine, imagine that since birth until now, imagine that you have never had never looked into a mirror, that you had never seen your reflection on a, on water or on a lake or anything. Just pretend for a moment that you had never seen your own reflection. <laughs> Would you know what you looked like? <laughs> No, right? You would not know what you looked like. The only way that you know what you look like is because you've stared at yourself in the mirror for years and years and years. Okay. So the mirror, what it does is it allows you to become aware of self. All right. So that's essentially what karma is. Karma is like that mirroring feedback system that allows you to get to know yourself. It allows you to self realize through karma, precisely because for every action that I have in this, in this reality, I receive a reaction precisely because of that feedback system. I get to know myself, not only myself, but I get to understand and experience what feels good to me, what feels right to me, what is in accordance with my soul and what's not. <laughs> all right. So this is all this is all what karma has done for us. Karma has been a very valuable feedback system that has allowed us to feel on our own skin, what we do in the world, what we intend in the world. All right. There would be no other way for me to understand and get to know myself on in my depths without this feedback system. So it's karma has been very, very valuable as an evolutionary tool for our souls, because through it, I'm constantly mirrored back with things that I do, things that I say, intentions that I have in life. They're constantly being mirrored back to me. And at that moment, at any given moment, when I'm receiving the feedback, when I'm getting the mirrors, when I'm receiving the karmic, uh, loop coming back to me, I can make a decision, whether it's something that I want to continue to perpetuate, whether I want to learn the lesson or whether I want to keep behaving in the same way. And the mirror will keep returning the same reflection. So karma is ultimately a feedback system that allows me to realize oneness. Ding, ding. <laughs> it allows me to realize oneness. That's why karma has been such a valuable ally, uh, evolutionary ally for our souls, because through going through these karmic loops, these karmic cycles being mirrored and receiving back the reaction of whatever action or intention I put out in the world. As I do this, I get to sort through and sift through the things about me that are true, that are untrue, the distortions that I have, the wounds that I have, the pains that I have, but also whether I am in separation consciousness or in unity consciousness or oneness. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a little while, why it's important and how karma completely changes as you come into more unity conscious and consciousness of one. So karma, aside from being a, a feedback system or a mirror, if you like to look at it that way, I'll, I'll give you another way of looking at karma. Also karma refines me. <laughs> okay. It allows me to sift through things and it refines me in the sense that through the feedback loop of karma, I get to know whether I am in connection with myself and with my soul or whether I'm not. Okay. And the way that it does that is because it's, it brings me experiences that allow me to feel ding, ding. Okay. Evolution of my soul occurs through feeling ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay. This is really important. It's not so much feeling emotional content, emotional charges are very evolutionary to me, both negatively and positively. Okay. So when karma returns to me, when the reaction to my action returns to me, I get to sift through those experiences and see how I feel about them. And also, you know, when I receive the reaction to an action of mine, I get to understand the lessons of those consequences. So for example, 
Let's say that I go and I punch someone in the face. I'm just making this up. I go and I just get really angry and I punch someone in the face, all right? And then let's say two days later, I'm in a grocery line and you know a mentally unstable person comes into the grocery store and they literally just lunge at me and they punch me in the face, all right? This is a very simplistic view of, of karma, by the way, but I'm just giving this example so that we can understand this a little bit better. So when I get punched in the face, <laughs> that, that's a totally different feeling than from when I I do the punching, right? So when I act, the feeling is totally different because I'm acting out of different feelings than the ones I receive when I receive that karma. So when someone punches me in the face, I get to feel on my skin the actions, the very actions that I submitted others to days before. Okay. And so it's in this mirroring back, this receiving, this sowing and reaping that I refine my evolution. I refine my soul. I allow myself to evolve further and further and further until I'm no longer in separation consciousness, until I realize that I'm connected to all things. That's what oneness means, okay? So this is essentially what karma means in, in a broad sense, looking at different types of examples and metaphors to help you get there. Now, the cool thing about karma, and I'm gonna talk about it more in a little while, but the cool thing about karma is that contrary to some of the traditions of the world that look more at karma as something that is set in stone or your destiny or whatever, karma is actually not so. Karma is only necessary. Uh, if, you, if you've been listening to what I've been saying up until now, Karma is only necessary if I live in separation consciousness. The moment that I self-realize karma as a system, as a feedback system becomes uh, unnecessary, but I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more um, further down in the video. But now I wanted to go through the three phases uh, of karma so that you understand that karma is not just one thing and you're not stuck in the wheel of karma. I disagree with uh, 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 Hinduism and Buddhism talk a lot about the wheel of karma and there's this understanding that you're sort of stuck in the wheel of karma. You have to keep coming back here lifetime after lifetime to you know work out your karma and then you get to leave. Almost like as if coming to earth were some kind of prison or punishment. I I don't see karma that way at all. So I'm going to share with you the, the three phases of karma so that you can see that, that it's time for us to broaden our understanding of what karma is. Okay. So the first phase of karma is what's called unconsciousness. All right. So in this phase of karma, I'm totally unconscious. As the word says, I'm totally unconscious. I have no idea what karma is. I have no idea that I reap what I sow. No idea. I'm completely unconscious as a human being. All right. Another way of saying this is I am completely stuck in what's called 3d consciousness or separation consciousness. I have no idea that I'm connected to all things. I have no idea that I'm a soul on a journey coming from, you know, the Godhead or source. I have no idea. I'm totally unconscious to that. All right. So in this first phase, karma is really something that, that is built into the unconsciousness. It's built into the matrix that I live in as an unconscious being, because it's through that karmic loop coming back to me that I'm going to start to move from unconsciousness towards waking up. All right. But in this first phase, karma is very important and karma is a permanent fixture in this level of consciousness because it's actually through karma and through the feedback loop and the mirroring of karma that I get to know that I'm in separation consciousness and there is such a thing as unity consciousness and it's time to go there. Okay. So karma is really important in phase, in phase one, this phase one of, of karma. This is where the planet has been and the majority of us have been for thousands of years. Okay. So we've been in this phase one of karma for thousands of years. And in fact, it's this phase one of karma that Hinduism and Buddhism talks about a lot. Okay. So, so we've been there for thousands of years in this sort of separation consciousness, 3d consciousness, but now comes phase two of karma. Okay. So phase two of karma is called awakening. And what that means is I start to wake up. 
uh, maybe through a spiritual awakening, maybe just a spontaneous awakening. It doesn't matter how it happens. The point is that I go from being unconscious to being conscious. <laughs> and it could be from one day to the next, or it could be through an initiation that takes multiple years. It doesn't matter. But the point is I wake up and now I suddenly know what karma is. <laughs> I know that it's a feedback system. I know that I'm a spiritual being going through this evolutionary, uh, uh, movement through, through the universe. I know that I am connected to source that I, that I am source incarnated. I start to experience all of these things. And so this second phase is an exciting phase because now we're starting to bridge 3d consciousness or separation consciousness with unity consciousness or what's called 5d consciousness. All right. So in this second phase of karma, I'm toggling between the two. I can't quite hold unity consciousness a hundred percent of the time. So I keep toggling. So maybe I have some wounds. Maybe I have some distortions. Maybe I have things that need to be healed within me that pull me into separation consciousness. But then sometimes maybe it's when I'm in meditation. Maybe it's when I'm connecting with a loved one. There are moments in my life where I feel boom, I feel that connection and I'm in 5d consciousness. I'm in unity consciousness, but then I just jump out sometimes. Okay. So this phase two karma still plays an important role because every time I come out of unity consciousness and I go into separation consciousness, karma becomes necessary as a teaching tool, as a feedback tool. So in this second phase, by the way, this is where the majority of the planet is. This is where the majority of us are right now in the three phases of karma, we are in the phase of awakening the second phase. And so karma is still somewhat important, although not as important as it was in phase one, because now when I'm in unity consciousness, karma dissolves, karma drops. Okay. So, so now karma plays less of a role when I'm awakening than it did when I was unconscious. Now, I don't want to go too deep on the difference between 3d consciousness and 5d consciousness, but I did shoot a video on that. And I'm going to leave a link in the description box below. If you want to go deeper on what this thing is, 3d consciousness versus 5d consciousness, check that video out for more details. The third phase of karma is called self-realization. And in this phase, I am 100% of the time in unity consciousness. I'm hundred percent of the time in 5d consciousness, meaning that I realize that I am connected to all things. I realize who I am on a soul level. I realize that I am a stream of consciousness that comes from source and that I am always connected to source and that I am always connected to all things. I self realize. Okay. When this phase comes, I no longer need karma. So karma dissolves. <laughs> All right. So this is where humanity is going. Humanity, as we shift more and more towards 5d consciousness, karma becomes less necessary. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit uh, in more detail, but karma becomes, uh, doesn't, do, is no longer necessary because if I self realize, if I know thyself, really know thyself, I don't need a mirror anymore. <laughs> I don't need a feedback system anymore. All right. I don't need a feedback system because when a person is self-realized, they're not going to go kill anybody. <laughs> so they won't need to receive the consequences of that, of that act because they know not to do it. Why? Because they are self-realized. All right. Now there haven't been a lot of people that have walked the earth self-realized. I can think of two examples, Jesus being one Buddha being the other. I bet there are more mystics that, that, that have been in this phase three of karma, but it has not been very common on the planet, but that's where we're moving towards. That's where our evolution of consciousness is going towards. The more we self realize, the less karma is necessary and it completely dissolves. Okay. On to part two of the video. And that is the truths about karma. <laughs> so I'm going to share seven uh, of them with you so that we really become clear on what karma is because there is, there's, there are just so much misinformation out there and misinterpretation of what karma is. That's just it, everything's so distorted. So I'm going to leave these seven truths about karma. Um, so that you can get really clear on what karma is, and that'll help you be able to work with karma later on. So the first truth is that karma is not necessary. I already touched upon that a little bit earlier in the video, but karma is not necessary. 
And this may be a little bit of a departure from the traditional uh, traditions that have talked about karma for thousands of years. This may be a bit of a departure, but th this is how I see it. It's not necessary. And the first, uh, the first time that I came in contact with this was when I was actually meditating and I was, I was contemplating this, this karma thing. What about karma? I was, I was thinking about it. I was in introspection. I was meditating and one of my guides came through and, and he just said something that, that I had to chew on for a while. He came came to me and he just said, Jesus didn't need a mirror. <laughs> and, and he knew to say Jesus because it was, it's one of my, Jesus is one of my favorite ascended masters and one that I work with very frequently and love so much. So when, when, when my guy just dropped that on my head, I really had to sit with that observation for a long time. I didn't understand what it meant at the time, but I wrote it down and I kept working with it. Jesus didn't need a mirror. And you know, if you don't follow Jesus or you don't care about Jesus, you could put any other master in that sentence. You could say Buddha if you want to, or Kuan Yin if you want to, it doesn't matter. But in this, in this, in my case, the sentence was Jesus didn't need a mirror. And you know, what did that mean? <laughs> well, it meant exactly what we've been talking about. Jesus or Buddha, these are self-realized beings. The moment that I become self-realized, I do not need a mirror because I don't need to see my reflection back to me because I already know myself. I already know myself to such a degree that the mirror becomes unnecessary. Okay. So this is a, the first truth about karma is that it's not necessary. Some traditions view karma as like this punishment that you're, you have to keep coming down here to work through all the bad deeds that you did in the past. And you're not going to come out of the wheel of karma until God knows when I do not see it that way. So, and as you saw in the three phases of, of karma, karma is not necessary. Uh, and that's where we're all going eventually. I don't know if in this lifetime or in multiple lifetimes after this, but that's where the progression and the evolution of our consciousness is going. It is not necessary. Karma is only necessary when I am unconscious, when I don't know who I am, when I have a lot of wounding and distortions in me. Otherwise there's no need for it. Truth number two is that karma is speeding up. <laughs> So in the traditional way of seeing karma and the way that it used to operate until very recently, karma was really a long arc, you know, kind of a, like Martin Luther King saying that, that the, the arc of truth is long, but it bends toward uh, the, what, what is it? Towards justice. Oh my God. I can't say the quote correctly, but I think it's the arc of, uh, the arc of truth bends towards justice. Martin Luther King said that or something around that. I'm not saying the quote straight, but so that to say that the arc is really long and has been really long when it has to do with karma. So for example, let's say that I killed someone two lifetimes ago. All right. And sometimes that mirroring of that action can take two lifetimes for it to come back and mirror and, and I receive, or I reap what I sowed two lifetimes ago. The reason that karma was so slow and has been so slow in the past is because my level of consciousness was really low. Okay. We were all living with extremely low levels of consciousness. The more unconscious I am, the slower uh, karma needs to be so that I can chew, digest, learn the experiences, right? So you can think of it you know, think of it, uh, of it between, um, you know, a student that may have a learning disability, for example, and they may need a little bit more time to learn things versus a student that's like, you know, has IQ off the charts and they just learn things so quickly. So these two people may need different time to, uh, to accumulate things, to have knowledge of things, to learn things. All right. And so it's the same thing with our souls too. When we are living in extreme states of unconsciousness, karma needed to be slower so that we, because we were learning slower at the time. All right. So, but now everything's changing, not just with the energy on the planet, but karma itself is speeding up and it's speeding up to accompany our evolution. So as more and more of us awaken, the more I go from unconsciousness to consciousness, the faster uh, karma goes because now I'm ready to understand the mirroring. Now I'm ready to incorporate the lessons at a faster rate because I'm awakening. I'm learning faster. Okay. So karma is speeding up. Whereas it used to take sometimes a lifetime or more for me to receive the feedback of an action or an intent that I had in my 3d environment. 
Now, it could be almost immediate. So sometimes, literally, I'll give you an example. You know, you can, uh, let's do the punch, punching someone in the face uh, example, because I used that before. Let's say I get really pissed off at someone, and I'm out in the street, and I just punch them in the face, okay? <laughs> punch them in the face, I'm violent, I punch them in the face, and then I turn around, and I go across the street, and I get hit by a car. <laughs> okay, this is a stupid example, but it's just to show you that that karmic loop took all of 10 seconds. I punched someone and then I crossed the street and I got hit by a car. Okay. So that is the speeding up that I'm talking about. It doesn't, but it doesn't have to be just negative things, right? Because karma isn't negative. All right. Karma isn't negative. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Karma just means I reap what I sow. Karma is a reaction to an action or an intent. Okay. But so now karma is moving very, very quickly which is good in the sense that it means that you're already ascending in consciousness and on your way to not needing karma anymore. But the speed of it also allows me to learn more quickly, which means I evolve more quickly, which means that I'm, I don't come down here to planet earth to be stuck in ruts, uh, for entire lifetimes. Like we used to, we used to be stuck in lifetime after lifetime of doing the same thing over and over and over again, no more. Now we're coming into a lifetime and we can heal and evolve faster than we ever have before. The third truth is that karma is not just about you. <laughs> okay. So karma is a complex, complex feedback system that has that, that branches out and ripples out far beyond you. Okay. So this is important to know because what it means is I'm, I'm going to have to take more responsibility for the things that I do and the intentions and the actions that I have in my 3d reality, because the truth about karma is that karma can propagate to various areas that have nothing to do with me or that goes way beyond me. So I'll give you an example. If you, for example, uh, murder someone in a lifetime, if you murder someone, your children will then carry that template, that karmic template from your action of murdering someone, even though they had nothing to do with it. Okay. That's the rippling effect of karma. Karma, especially if it's bigger, and I'll, I'll give an example of big karma versus little karma. But the smaller the action, the less consequences, the action, the less that karma affects the souls around you, the bigger the action, the more impactful the action, the more it ripples out and it affects my entire soul family or any group that I belong to, depending on the size of the karma. So for example, let's say that I murder someone or I attack someone or whatever, and then that ripples into my children. Maybe, um, uh, just that that's smaller, right? A smaller effect, but let's compare that for example, to the collective karma that I'll give you an example from my own country of, of, uh, where my parents were born. I wasn't born here, but that's where my heritage is from Portugal. So Portugal had a long, long, that's just now clearing up. Portugal had a really long karmic, big karmic load on the entire country and the entire Portuguese society because Portugal was one of the first colonial powers in the world. So the Portuguese went everywhere in the world and they basically took slaves, they pillaged, uh, they destroyed first nations people. Um, they just did a lot of shenanigans as all colonial powers have done on the planet. And so that's big that those are really big, painful actions. And that the consequences of that is that all Portuguese then carried that karmic load of colonialism. Thankfully, because of people like me and so many other light workers, when I awakened, I actually started to work on the land. I knew that it was going to be important for me, not only to clear my own karma, but I had to clear the karma of my parents and of the country of my parents' birth, which was Portugal. So part of my healing process was actually to help heal the karmic load of colonialism within Portugal. But there are other examples, you know, Germany, for example, still holds a strong karmic load after World War II and all of the atrocities that were done in World War II. Um, but in the U.S. too, I can give multiple examples. In the U.S., still to this day, Americans, which is my country of birth, uh, we as Americans have are still healing a very strong karmic load from the founding of the country, also based on displacement of First Nation and Native Americans, but also on slavery. The, the country was built on slavery initially. And so that's really strong, heavy wounding that rippled out to all Americans. Okay. So this, these are just a few examples to show you that karma, it's not just 
held within me. If it's big enough, it's going to be held in my family, my soul group, my tribe, my race, my society, my entire country. Okay. So the bigger the karma, the more it ripples out to everyone around me and to significant number of people, depending on the load of the karma. Truth number four is that karma is not a punishment. <laughs> okay. So again, this could be a departure from the way the traditional, um, the original traditional cultures have seen karma when they started talking about it, but it is not a punishment. I do not see it as a punishment at all. Again, karma is simply the mirroring back or a feedback system that informs you of the content of your actions and your intentions in the world. So karma, here's a ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So you never forget about karma because this is probably one of the most misconceptions that we have about karma. And if you've ever heard the term karma is a bitch, <laughs> have you ever heard that term? We use it a lot in the English language. Karma is a bitch. When we say that, what are we saying? We're already denoting karma as being something bad. It's not at all. All right. So here's the ding ding that I want you to remember. Karma is neutral. <laughs> karma is neutral in the same way that a mirror is neutral. When I look in the mirror, is it, or is it not true that that mirror, if it's clean, obviously let's, let's start with the, <laughs> let's start with the assumption that the mirror is totally clean and spotless. If I stand in front of a clean mirror, is it, or is it not true that that mirror is an accurate representation of my own reflection. Okay. There's mirrors, not emotional. The mirror is not punishing you. The mirror is not, if your face is full of mud and you look at the mirror, it's not the mirror's fault that your face is full of mud. Your face is full of mud. So the mirror shows that to you. So karma is neutral. All right. So the whole karma is a bitch term is very, very wrong. And it, it comes from this idea that we have, especially in Western society, that karma is a punishment. It is not, it's very neutral meaning that it's a feedback system that will constantly return to you what you are giving out, what you are intending and what you're acting. So even though in this video up until now, I've been giving negative karma examples, there are also positive karma examples. So the more that I love people, the more that love is returned to me. Same thing. <laughs> the more that I am kind in the world, the more that kindness is returned to me. You see, so I could give, I could give positive karma examples. Also, the point here is is to really once and for all debunk this myth that karma is a punishment. It is not karma is neutral. Now there are a couple of side notes that I want to leave here. <laughs> I love my little side notes. My little ding ding side notes are important, especially pertaining to this truth, because this is, this is such a common myth about karma that there's so much misinformation out there that I feel like I need to go a little deeper in this so that we really eradicate debunk this myth once and for all. So I'm going to leave you a couple of side notes. The first side note has to do with messages that I actually receive quite frequently <laughs> and that uh, now I'm receiving less thankfully. And I think it's, it's because, you know, as you all have been joining the channel and watching the videos and we've all been evolving together, thankfully I've been receiving less of these messages, but I used to get them with a lot of frequency. And so here's the message. I'll give you an example. I'll get an email from someone and the person will say, uh, hi, Christina, you know, I just, I want, I want you to tell me, um, you know, my husband, husband has just left me for another woman. And I want to know when it is that karma is going to hit her like she deserves for destroying my life. Okay. Now, what is this side note? I really want you to understand the intention and the energy. Cause remember karma has to do with intention, not just with action, your intention. The reason that you do something in your environment is just as important as the action itself. Okay. So let me add a ding ding to that. So we never forget this. Your intention is just as important as the action. Okay. So let's remember this about karma, right? Intention is just as important as the actual ac action. So if intention is important, what do you think this person, this supposed woman that just emailed me and asked me when karma is going to hit the other woman for taking her husband and destroying her life? What do you think is happening in this situation? That woman that sent me the email is creating karma for herself. Why? Because she's intending harm on another human being. <laughs> 
You see? So unintentionally, she's not even conscious that she's doing this, but in intending harm for someone else, she's causing karma to herself. All right. So that mirror is going to be returned to herself in one way or another. Okay. So that's, that's one uh, side note that I wanted to leave here to please, please focus on intention. Remember that intention also creates karma. So take responsibility, make sure that you are not acting or intending out of unity consciousness and make sure you're not intending in separation consciousness, because the only way that I could intend harm on another human being is if I'm in separation consciousness and I don't know that that person is me and I'm them. <laughs> We're connected. And so if I don't know that I'm going to intend harm on that person, not realizing that if I intend harm on them, I'm harming me, I'm harming myself. All right. So that's one little side note that I wanted to leave here, uh, within this, you know, karma is not punishment, uh, uh, heading. The other side note I wanted to leave here is about, uh, karma as a punishment and when bad things happen. Okay. So I do not want to leave you with the impression that if something bad happens to you, that it must be karma you're reaping from something bad you did in a past life or years ago or whatever. Sometimes I do receive these messages and they're, they're a little bit heartbreaking because the person doesn't realize that it, it's, they're being too black and white. And so I always caution people against being black and white, being absolutist in their thinking. All right. So karma, and I've said this in videos before, but I'm going to say it in this one also because it's pertinent. Karma is the law of karma is one of many, many laws and many cogs <laughs> in this whole machine that we call life, that we call uni the universe. Okay. So there are so many things going on. This is a very complex system and karma is one of the cogs in that whole system. All right. So it's one part of the whole. So what I mean by this is that you can be certain that painful things are going to happen to you in your life as they've happened in mine and maybe will continue to happen too. You know, it's just, it's just the nature of life. Painful things can happen to us that have nothing to do with karma. Okay. So please remember this karma. Isn't this black and white thing. It doesn't govern everything. It's one part in a bigger system and painful things, bad things can happen to you that have nothing to do with karma. It has nothing to do with you doing something bad in the past. All right. So I wanted to leave this side note here. Sometimes we do go through painful things in life and they have nothing to do with karma. Truth number five is that the wheel of karma is ending. <laughs> I talked about this a little bit previously, so I'm not going to go too much into this. But, um, when I talked about the three phases of karma, I, I emphasize that karma it, it's the, the wheel of karma is ending because as we move into unity consciousness, as we move into 5d consciousness, karma becomes unnecessary because when I self realize I don't need a mirror anymore, I don't need that feedback system. All right. So this is another truth. Karma is ending especially as we move into unity consciousness. Truth number six is that karma is not set in stone. So again, this departs a little bit from the traditions that usually talk about karma. Karma is seen a little bit more statically, meaning that it's almost, it's almost conflated with Dharma or with my life path. So, uh, it, there's more, there's more rigidity when it comes to karma, um, in according to some of the older traditions on the planet. Uh, but karma is not set in stone at all. So I could have, for example, let's say that I murdered someone in a past life, whatever. Let's say I murdered someone in a past life, but then, uh, that karma never came back to me. So now I'm in this life, but I wake up, I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, unity consciousness. We're all one. I'm connected. Oh my God. And I start meditating and I start healing and I start healing past lives. And in the healing of the past lives, I say, you know, I, I ask for forgiveness of my creator. I wash, I heal everything that I have ever done in the past that has caused harm on this planet. I, I do some whole Pono Pono. That's another great practice that you can use for healing, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but I start doing the healing. I come into unity consciousness. Then that's that <laughs> you see, it's not set in stone, meaning that 
I murdered someone in a past life, but then I woke up in this one, so the loop of the karma didn't need to come back to me because I woke up and I healed and I cleansed that karma from the past without it having to materialize in the 3D world. You can do this, okay? So karma's not set in stone. The moment that I awaken and I start to ascend in consciousness and I start to clear my karma from the past, it no longer needs to loop back at me so it doesn't need to materialize in my 3D world world. And the seventh truth that's a continuation of the sixth one is that karma can be cleared easily. <laughs> okay, so this may be a little bit of a departure too from how it's usually seen because karma is seen a little bit a little bit more rigidly, like almost like you can't get out of the wheel of karma no matter what you do. And that's not true at all, especially in these new energies. In these new energies, you can heal and clear thousands of years worth of karma. Let me leave this as a ding ding so that you never forget this. In this current energy, in this era of Pisces, we can clear thousands of years worth of karma in one lifetime. Okay. So again, this is easy to clear. Does it take some time? Sure. It may take some time because I have to go deeper and deeper and deeper in my healing to understand my wounding, to see things, to feel things that may have been done in the past, to understand my wounding, to understand my past life stuff, all of these things. Sure. But it can be cleared very easily on the spot with the help of ascended master. So when I'm clearing karma, I call on the highest possible energy, the highest possible ascended masters to help me do the clearing, but I also take responsibility for the clearing first, okay? I take responsibility for doing my own karmic clearing, and then I seek assistance from others just to help in the process, all right? And one of the ways that I just talked about was the use of Ho'oponopono. That's a great tool uh, for you to use. Ho'oponopono is just, uh, it's a Hawaiian prayer um, that consists of four parts. I love you, I'm sorry, please, forgive me. Thank you. Okay. Just four parts to the prayer and you can repeat this prayer over and over and over and over. Okay. Um, the more that you do this, this is a very healing prayer. I use Ho'oponopono a lot, uh, in whenever I'm dealing with any kind of karmic imprint or anything that I need to heal from the past, but it can clear easily. We can do this work easily now. So there's the seventh truth. Exciting, isn't it? Okay, on to part number three, and that is how to work with karma. <laughs> okay, so now that we've debunked some common myths and brought some truth into, into the equation, that karma really isn't a punishment especially, and that's very neutral, that it's only a mirroring or a, a feedback system to help you evolve. Now that we know all of that, how can we better work with karma? Because here's the thing, if you don't know how to work with karma, if you don't know how to clear it, it's just going to keep playing out in your life. It's just going to keep playing out in your life because you have to come into a certain level of consciousness to know how to clear that karma, know how to work with it. And as you're ascending in your consciousness, that's how the karma clears. All right. So I'm going to give you three simple tips to help you um, do this. And you can do these three tips. It doesn't have to be in any specific order that I give you in this, in this video, but these tips are very simple, but they're very powerful in helping you work with karma in a positive way so that you can use karma to your advantage and get out of these ruts that we sometimes spend lifetimes in. Tip number one is introspection and self-awareness. This seems obvious, right? We've been talking in this video about how karma is a simple mirroring or a feedback system. All right. So let's just take the example that it's a mirror. If it's a mirror, then that means that the more that I see myself, the more that I'm introspective, the more that I'm self-aware, the more that I understand and acknowledge what's true about me, what's not, the more that I see the distortions and the wounds in me, the more that I clear all of that up, the more self-aware I become, the more unnecessary the mirror becomes. Okay. So that's the first tip is this self-awareness because remember karma is only necessary when I'm unconscious. Okay. When I don't know what I'm doing. And so I need to see the consequences of my actions in order to learn. All right. So when I'm self-aware, the more that I'm self-aware, the more that I go inward, the more that I clear all of the distortions that I have that prevent me from seeing life really as oneness. That is the nature of reality is oneness. Anytime 
time that I don't see oneness, that I'm not in unity consciousness, the only reason that I'm doing that is because there's wounding or distortions in me that's preventing me to, from seeing or experiencing that oneness. Okay. So this first tip is crucial. Be really self-aware, look inward, take time to meditate, take time to understand your feelings, to feel your feelings, to process your experiences, to heal all of these things. Okay. The more that you are self-aware, the more unnecessary the mirror is. The second tip is to heal your wounds and distortions. <laughs> so the example I gave a little while ago about, you know, let's say you had your face full of mud and then you stood in front of a mirror. Well, the mirror is going to show you the mud. <laughs> so do you, are you going to clean up your face or not? <laughs> because if you don't clean up your face, what's the mirror going to do? It's going to keep mirroring back a dirty face. And so that's essentially why healing your distortions and wounds is absolutely crucial because the more that I heal, the less the mirror is necessary and also the less karma I create. Because here's, here's a ding ding that I'm going to leave. We, you probably heard this so many times before, but it's, it, it really is important to say here. All right. So I'm going to say a common saying that we, that we use in English only hurt people, hurt people. <laughs> okay. This is so true. So, so true. What's the translation of this? I have to be wounded. I have to be in separation consciousness in order to harm someone else. Because if I were in unity consciousness, I would not harm. Okay. So I harm, I, 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 I perpetuate harmful actions or intent in my outside environment and in my life as a direct consequence of my wounding. So the wounding needs to be healed in order for that mirror to clear up. Because again, the mirror will continue to show me what I am. All right. What I have on my energy system. All right. So clean it up heal everything you have to heal from past lives, from this lifetime, heal, heal, heal. And if you have no idea how to start your healing work, I'm going to leave a video here in the description box below. It's going to give you a very detailed way of going about healing, what healing really entails. So check out that video after you watch this one. And now I want to go a little bit deeper into the word distortions because I've been using that word frequently here in this video, but a lot of times people don't even know what distortions mean. All right. So let's go into this a little bit. So what are distortions? When I'm talking about distortions, what do I mean? Distortions are essentially lies or untruths about you that are clouding who you are. They're clouding who you are. So let's use the mirror as an example. And let's say that I give you a big dirt dirty cloak. And let's say I give you this big cloak and I say, put this cloak over you and you put the cloak over you. And then I say, stand in front of the mirror and you stand in front of the mirror. Will you accurately see who you are in front of that mirror? <laughs> no, because you got this dirty, disgusting cloak over you and it's masking your true reflection. All right. That's a distortion and we all have them. And I'm going to give you some examples of what distortions are. So distortions are untruths about us. And it could be untruths that we hold about ourselves or that others hold about us. It doesn't matter. But the untruths that others hold out of a hold about, about us are not important. What's really, really damaging to us are the distortions that we hold about ourselves. Okay. So here are some common distortions, uh, for you to really get into the whole distortion thing and what it is a uh, distortion, for example, is believing that I'm not good enough. You see, that's a huge distortion. Why? Because it is not true at all. That's not my soul essence. My soul essence is worthy of love. My soul essence is constantly loved. So the moment that I don't believe that to be true, the moment that I start believing that I'm not good enough, I create a distortion in my field, just like as if I would put a cloak over me. And if I do that, every time I'm going to be looking in the mirror, I'm going to see a distorted reflection of me. That's not true. So I need to clear that cloak. I need to throw it off of me. And the way that I do that is I have to heal these beliefs. All right. So the belief that I'm not good enough, um, the belief that I'm not worthy of love, uh, the belief that I'm not smart enough, whatever, whatever beliefs you hold about yourself, if they are not the beliefs that are held by your source, they are called distortions. All right. So here's another way of looking at a distortion. A distortion is 
a belief that I hold that's different from the belief that my source, my creator holds about me. <laughs> There's a better way of even putting it, what a distortion is. A belief that I hold about myself that my source does not share, <laughs> okay? So if I believe I'm not good enough, my source up there is saying, what? That's not true, that's not how I see you. <laughs> I love you, you're worthy, I love you, and the source keeps pouring love onto you, but if you don't believe it, you create a distortion in your field, and then you're gonna act out according to those distortions because we act out of our wounds and our beliefs every single day, every all the time, okay? So this is what a distortion is. You've got to heal those. So it's not just wounds. You don't just have to heal things that happened to you in the, pla in the past, for instance, you know, if you were sexually abused or something like that, something horrible that happened to you. Yeah, you do have to heal that, but you also have to heal the beliefs that you hold about yourself that are in contradiction to the beliefs that your source has about you because that creates distortions and those distortions will play out in your life and it will affect the karma, the feedback system and the karma that comes to you. The third tip is to practice connection. <laughs> you knew that was coming probably, right? So when I talked about the three phases of karma, the last phase is, is that, that self-realization, that unity consciousness, 5D consciousness, where karma is not necessary. Well, the way that I get there is every single day I'm going to practice connection, meaning I'm going to practice coming into 5D consciousness more and more. Now, sometimes, you know, for, for maybe a few of us on the planet right now, we can hold ourselves in 5D consciousness 100% of the time. There are maybe some masters out there that can do that. But for the majority of us, we're all learning how to go into 5D consciousness, but then stuff happens in our life and then boom, we're back into separation consciousness. And then we meditate and we connect with God and we're like, oh my God, ohm. And then we're back in unity consciousness. And then we get up from meditation and we have an argument with our partner and then we're back into separation consciousness. So we're toggling. The majority of us are toggling between this 3D and 5D reality. Okay. So the more that you practice connection, the more that you practice coming into oneness, coming into unity consciousness, connecting to all things, knowing and experiencing your connection to all things, experiencing yourself as an extension of source energy, as God in a body, as your divinely, divinely loved. Okay, so experiencing yourself as a divine being that's so loved, the more that you practice this type of connection, the more karma becomes unnecessary, the lighter it becomes in your life too, especially negative karma, all right? So as you practice connection, karma becomes more uh, unnecessary in your life. Now, how do you practice connection? You could do a ton of things to connect with source, to feel more connected. For all of us, it's gonna be different. For some of us, meditation connects us to our source. Other people who aren't even spiritual, they connect to source without even knowing they're connecting to source by going into nature and just being in nature. So being in nature can be an exercise of connection for some people. Hanging out with the people that I love, dancing, all kinds of things. I could keep going and on and on and on, but you know what connects you. You know what makes you feel good and connected to the universe. So start doing those activities more and more and more. Aside from having a beautiful, beautiful change in self-perception, that's also important. That's also an exercise in, in connection. Again, if I clear my distortions, I start to see myself as my source sees me, and the more distortions I clear, the more connected I am, okay? So changing my self-perception, if I have a negative self-perception, changing that perception to the perception of my source is also an exercise in being connected, <laughs> okay? So there's the third one. Practice connection, go more into 5D consciousness, and karma will become unnecessary in your life. Okay, beautiful soul, now I wanna hear from you. Leave me in the comments below which one of these tips about karma are you going to start implementing first in your life? Let me know in the comments below. Click here to subscribe to my channel or head over to my website to download my brand new guided meditations. They're free and they're amazing. And don't forget this video here where I talk about the difference between 3D and 5D consciousness. This is gonna be pertinent for you. All right, beautiful soul, I love you. I'm out.